This excerpt was taken from a Full and Bloom interview with producer Bo Hill. You can listen to the entire interview at fullandbloom.com. Click the link below. Juan is a very good bass player, and he was also a very good singer. So Juan, Juan and I did 90% of the background vocals, just the two of us. And, you know, on some of the, the lower stuff, like Lay It Down, you know, Robin sang a little bit on that one. But primarily it was Juan and I. And and I did all the vocal arrangements, so I had everything charted out. And uh, and I'd give it to Juan in, in my Sanskrit notation. And... I'd say, okay, here's, let's do this part this way. We always sang everything in unison so that the combo of our two voices made this other third person. So I don't know if that, if that makes any sense. So if there was like a three-part harmony, Juan and I would together sing the low part, then together sing the middle part, then together sing the high part. So it didn't sound like Juan and it didn't sound like me. It sounded like Fred. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your background vocals on that album as well, huh? Or on all the rat? Yep. Bass, do you typically, would you record Juan direct or would you mic him up or what was your go to? Both. We would do a DI and we would mic his amp. And I think he was he was playing, you know, I think he was playing the standard kind of back in those days, the Ampeg SBT. I think. I could be mistaken with that, but that's what I'm drawn to right now. Robin Crosby, you said that probably you were closest to him out of any of the members. Yeah. And what was he like I, I, to work with? He he was um, he was he was just a lot of fun. That's that's what I remembered. And he would always he came up with <laughs> with these weird things, and he would say he he'd walk in and he'd listen to Stephen warming up, for example. I remember he was standing in the hall, so Stephen couldn't see him, and and he said, uh, "I'm sure glad the girls." sexy because he can't sing and then he would come in and he'd listen to me doing some of my ridiculous stuff that I would do when he'd come into work the next day and, and he, he said man you've really made that very bobadelic <laughs> that that became sort of a of a you know, the catchphrase you know he'd come in and he wouldn't like something that was going on in a particular song and he'd say Bo you gotta get that thing more bobadelic okay alright I'll do that Robin is there a point where you notice any issues with Robin as he started to decline or is there a point in the sequence of albums where you were like hey I notice a difference in Robin yes and no I had always sort of you know, suspected in the back of my head that Robin had some issues, but he was very masterful at masking what was what was going on. You know, he he was a big guy. He was six five, and so even when he when he'd had that you know tenth vodka tonic too many, it it didn't. It, you know, he just got he got buzzed and got drunk like everybody else. But it, it was the drug use that he hid very, very well. And I and I knew that something was wrong when I was recording somebody else at um, at Enterprise Studios, and the front desk called me and they said, "Hey, Robin Crosby came by to see you." And I said, "Oh, great, send him in." And he came in the control room and he pulled me over to the side and he said, "He said, hey." Uh, how much money you got on you? I said, I don't know. I got 80 bucks, 100 bucks, something like that. And he said, can I borrow it? And I said, what do you mean? He got kind of agitated. And he was just like, look, man, I just need some money. I need it right now. Because he was, you know, he was there with his uh, drug dealer. And, and who was a guy? I didn't know. So, you know, I gave, I gave him the money. And that's when I really knew that, he, that there were some very deep problems with him. And is this after you're working with Rad, or still in the cycle of working with them? No, this was uh, this was I, I had already finished um, Reach for the Sky, and I was on to the next project. And um, you know, and he just he just showed up, and there we go. And you didn't notice anything on say when you're recording Reach for the Sky? You don't notice like a difference yeah, in the studio? Uh, yeah, a little bit. He was he was a little more. Um, absent than he than he normally was and so you know warren was doing i think at that point robin didn't even attempt to do any solos so warren did everything i believe that's correct so you know robin came in played his rhythm guitar parts and then pretty much left and i didn't see him you know much during the during the recording at all and the previous album he was still okay well um 
I think an argument could be made that 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 he wasn't okay ever. Yeah. <laughs> but for dancing undercover, I he was he was more present. I mean, yeah, he was he was there and, and he would run interference for me and help me out as much as he as he possibly could. And um, yeah, I don't I don't don't remember. It was just on Reach for the Sky. There was. He just wasn't around very much. How was it working with Warren? How would you describe him? Um, well, Warren is—he's an absolute genius, in in my opinion. And you know, my biggest problem with Warren, from a recording point of view, and I made one of my worst mistakes with him. My bad call. We were back in those days, you know. You had certain physical restrictions, like number of tracks available, and blah 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 blah. Even if you were running two machines simultaneously, you know there still was a limitation. And we were doing a solo, and I wish I could remember what it was, but we did it, and I didn't have any spare tracks to say it. And Warren did this most mind-blowing solo first take. So I just said, okay, so let's just, you know, we'll just warm up into this and uh, and then we'll get down to work. And so I, you know, he said, okay. So I roll the tape and I sneak over and I go ahead and press it and make it red. He plays this mind blowing solo, start to finish. It was perfect. And I stood there with my jaw hanging open and I said, my friend, I, I think we're done. And and Warren said, no way, there isn't no wall. Oh, man, I can do a lot better than that. He said, well, I only had a chance to do it one time. I mean, come on, these are going to get better and better and better. And I went, I went, okay, you know, you certainly earned the right to uh, have another another go at it. So we had another go, and we did not even get within spitting distance of that first one, in my opinion. And so that, that was my takeaway from Warren is that he was one of those kind of guys where I can always do it better. No, no, I can't. I really can't. And uh, sometimes he did, and a couple of times he didn't. It was one of those one of those lessons, you know, those painful lessons learned in the studio. <laughs> did you have at that time a favorite vocal chain for Stephen Piercy? Not really. Um, Stephen's vocals sort of evolved. It, it wasn't it wasn't something that I had set out to do. Um, I believe we recorded him on a Neumann U67 on Seller, and then um, I always I, I, I tried to use like mics that were warm and and that would give his his vocal as much body as possible. And then um, on Seller. We we did his vocals on a Neve, and and I'm sh and I used the uh, what the hell was it called? The eleven seventy six eleven ninety two. Oh, sorry. It, it's a it it was a inboard compressor on on the Neve, and I think that's what I used on his vocal. And I think I also used the uh, uh, onboard EQ, if memory serves. Yeah, I'm assuming you used the Neve board on uh, the basic tracks at Sound City. Uh huh. Yeah, that same board, I guess, the one that uh, yeah, they sold. bought. Right, which I think they featured uh, Rad or maybe Stephen and Warren in that film. Yeah, and they, they called me and, and asked me to, you know, give them some specific information on, on the movie, which I was glad to do. How was it working with Stephen? Well, uh, at first, it was, it, it took us a little while to kind of get in sync with each other. Um, but what wound up happening was we kind of did Stephen's vocals a little differently. Um, because he had been doing these songs live for so long, he kind of got into a, a rhythm, and it was difficult for him to kind of break out of it. So if I came up with an idea to change the melody or something like that, you know, I'd say, so Stephen, try something a little bit different on this word. And, and it was hard for him to, to do that on the fly. And... So I started singing stuff to him over the talkback. I said, try this, you know, go da 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 whatever. And, and he did it. So if I kept feeding him the melodies that I, that I was hearing and that I wanted to, to at least try on the song, then I'd feed it to him and he'd do it. So pretty much that's kind of how we, that's how we did Steven. So much so that when we went to pre-production for, for Invasion, Steven didn't even show up. And the guys in the band were starting to get pissed. And, um, you know, why won't you show up? And he said, well, 
Bo's going to change everything anyway when we get in the studio, so why do I need to waste my time coming to rehearsal? So we basically worked on these songs, and nobody was really sure exactly how the melodies were going to go 100%. I mean, you know, they had, we had ideas, but it wasn't... It wasn't finalized until Stephen and I went through our process line by line in the studio, which made everybody a little nuts, which I can understand because nobody really knew what it was going to sound like when we were done. But anyway, it just it was just a way of communication that Stephen and I kind of kind of developed, and I'm sure he was probably quite frustrated with me, uh, you know, changing stuff on him all the time. But at the end of the day, the you know, the results were pretty good. Were you doubling his vocals most of the time? Yes. I'm assuming. So, oh, go ahead. So what, what I did with Stephen, and I actually kind of continued to do this throughout my career, we would do three takes of the song. And depending on how his voice was, what we would do a lot of times, um, you know, on a lot of those songs back in those days, the chorus repeats at the end over and over and over ad nauseum. So I would have Stephen start on the choruses at the out just to get his voice warmed up and get it where it's really sounding very Steven-y. And then we'd go back and start recording the front of the song. And so we'd keep working until I got three complete takes. Then I'd call the session and that was it. So in the early the next morning, I would always show up for work around eight o'clock or so because the guys in the band didn't like working that early. Actually, they didn't like working at 10 o'clock, which is when I had band call. But I would go in and I would do a vocal comp because I was fresh and, and well-rested and I could be more objective about, you know, did we catch a fish or did we not? And then I put together the very best of the three takes and I play that back to Steve when he came in to work the next day. And if, you know, we'd listen to it and he'd say, yeah, you know, first verse is okay, but I think I got a better second verse in me. Okay, great. Or I would say, look, we, the choruses are okay, but the verses suck. So let's give it another go. So we do the same procedure and I, and I would keep the best stuff on its own private track. And then we go do three more. And then I'd do the whole process again and see if I actually had anything on day two that would rival what I thought was good on day one. If you, you kind of understand what I'm saying? Sure. And so that was that was really just our little process of how we did it. And then once we got to the point where he was singing, but we weren't beating the uh, the master comp, then we're done. That was it. Very cool. How was Bobby in the studio? I'm sure he was well prepared, but how was he to work with? Uh, very difficult. Very difficult. He was out of everybody. He was the one that was always the hardest to please. Something was not right with just about everything. And uh, yeah, he, he was he was my least favorite guy to spend any time with. He was at least in my estimation, he was kind of generally a uh, generally uh, I don't know how I could put this. Um, generally just disagreeable. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Bobby didn't write at all, right? Well, that there, there again was another uh, very sensitive point was when the guys in the band that wrote the material that were hits started getting these Ch fat publishing checks right. that Bobby wasn't getting, that really created some problems. Um, and so we tried to, if not directly, indirectly give Bobby a couple of half credits or something like that on the record just to keep peace in the family. But he didn't necessarily write anything, even coming up with kind of drum ideas? We differentiated, you know, he's being paid as the drummer, and the drummer is supposed to come up with drum ideas, and that's not writing. We distinguish writing as melody and lyrics. Okay. So, you know, we didn't give Warren a writing credit for coming up with a solo. If he came up with, you know, with the, of course. a verse and a chorus idea, here's the chords, blah, 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 then, yeah, then he got in on the writing. And, of course, at the end of the record, when it came time for everybody to determine and put on paper, you know, who did what to who and who wrote what and blah, 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 blah. I mean, those were always incredibly tense discussions, you know, because it was like, oh, man, he didn't say that. Oh, yeah, he did. Yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, it got like eighth graders at recess and especially egregious. You know, once, once these guys started figuring out how much money potentially was at 
play. You know, everybody would lobby like crazy for their position. I mean, nobody was going to give up without a fight. And so it was a fight every time. Yeah, well, at least they were uh, conscious of it. A lot of guys I've interviewed, um, they weren't even thinking about it. I kind of felt bad for Bobby later, even though, uh, you know, he took even going out on rat on his own and stuff like that. I was like, I kind of understood because I'm like, that guy didn't get any of that money. He doesn't have anything that kind of keeps coming in. Well, he, he would. He has his 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 rat royalties. Of course, but the publishing is where, kind of in the later years, is what keeps uh, paying the bills, right? It's the gift that keeps on giving. Two. 